I'm actually pretty pretty optimistic on the on the global economy. We see that we have uh, some bumps in the road for emerging markets. We see it in in China slowing down, but still a pretty high growth compared to many of the uh, of the more mature markets. Um, we certainly have not good growth in Brazil, which is for IFF an important market because it's a very important fragrance fragrance market. But if I look at, at Europe, we see signs of recovery, and also the U.S. is, is recovering as, as, as well. So we are pretty optimistic for the next 18 months. We have to get used to volatility. It's just the world and we are in, because you have more and more, let's say, countries which are important to the global economy, which are volatile in nature, whether it is politically or from the economic point of view. And that basically means that we have to get used to balancing our country portfolio in the countries where we are doing business, it is usually not a good idea to remove your whole operations out, out of the market because the re-entrance is usually very costly. So what you have to do is you have to be fast enough to downsize and hibernate your op operation if it has a severe downturn, but still stay engaged in, in, in the market. We see that uh, the millennials in, uh, in Western Europe or, or in the US have a complete, uh, let's say, different view how they view uh, the work, how they view, uh, view their, um, their work environment and how they want to interact with, with, their, with their superiors, which is probably much more collegial and uh, the career as a career is probably not the most important thing in, in life for these millennials because they really want to want to balance uh, their, their work life. They want to look what, what else they can do, which is completely different uh, in countries when you go to India or to China, where which is probably a bit more like in the times after Second World War in Europe, where everybody wants to make a career, they want to progress, they want to progress in their economic status. And here, for example, work-life balance has a complete different meaning for them. So for us as a global company, you basically have to tailor your offerings to these different groups within, within the company, which have completely different demands and, and, and different uh, uh, looks at the world, how, how they want to deal with, uh, with, their, with their employer. If you want to manage a, a global workforce, I, I actually believe that uh, the core processes have to be very similar and, and, and very stable. But you have to have enough flexibility to create incentives for your workforce in the different geographies of, of the world because there's just a different demand uh, in, in India than it is, for example, in, uh, in, in Germany for what they need in terms of their, let's say, uh, remuneration, in terms of their incentive systems, and in and, and, and form of their workspace as well. And I think this flexibility we have to create as a company, despite the robust backbone we need so that, that we treat our employees equally. We came up with a, with a new purpose statements, uh, statement for, uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, we needed something which is a bit broader than our previous uh, uh, purpose, purpose statement because we want to broaden our business activities. And I'll give you one example. We were never an active cosmetic ingredients. Now we are. And that has to fit into, in, into our broader uh, purpose statement as well. Then the next thing is we believe that we just can grow our business through differentiation. And differentiation is basically driven by innovation. And that's the reason why we have the catalyst in here. Because the innovation comes on one hand out of our research labs, but it comes out of collaboration with partners, with biote uh, biotech companies, with other partners in, in academia. So being a catalyst and bringing these people and the research results together is something very important for us. What was really important for us when we have created our Vision 2020 is to look into our markets and into our product portfolio, what has changed since last strategy and what will change in, in the next five, five to 10 years. And there are a couple of really exciting trends, for example, how you can digitalize scent, for example, how you can look for different and new customer groups despite uh, uh, the, the usual ones. Imagine for, for a second that uh, some of your, your kids or yourself, you have, have one of these gaming consoles and you listen to the sound, you see a visual, and you have a scent at the same time uh, for what's happening during, during the game or during, during the movie. That's, for example, something we're working with, uh, with more of the tech companies right now, how to, how to realize it and how to make that happen.
were not always very well known to the to the to the public, but it's a very cool cool business. It's it's driven by science, it's driven by data, but it's driven by art as well. And that's something which attracts a lot of people because on one hand we come up with new molecule molecules for fragrances, but to put all of these molecules together you need a perfumer. And then you come up with a very unique scent and that makes a difference for millions of, of, of uh, consumers. And there's one thing probably people don't know, but uh, there are less per perfumers on this world than active uh, astronauts. The usual answer, I, I guess, for for person in, in, in my age bracket is you do it with your teenage old uh, uh, kids, and that's that's indeed uh, uh, the case. Um, I learn a lot from my 16-year-old daughter, but what we what we do in in, in our company in IFF uh, is on a regular basis to have contacts to uh, West Coast companies to uh, in, in the Bay Area whether it is more on the biotech side or it is more on the tech side as well, so that we have regular con conversations, what's happening and what are the latest trends which could impact our industry and our company.